Yeah. So it is my uh, great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Andrea Alou from City University of New York. Um, Andrea is actually uh, the founding uh, member and Einstein professor uh, of the Photonics Initiative. Um, so the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center. Andrea is also the president of Metamorphose uh, and uh, is, uh, well, a world leader in metamaterials. And today, Andrea is going to talk about beyond the limitations of passive acoustic metamaterials using dispersion engineering and complex frequency excitations. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank, thank you, Bogdan and Mohamed, for, for inviting and uh, everyone for, for joining. And um, yeah, I, I gave a similar seminar a uh, few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think. And I'm excited to be again on the on this uh, platform and uh, to show our new results in the area of uh, acoustics and elastics. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the motivation for us uh, is more broad uh, than, than just uh, acoustics. Uh, it's the idea of trying to push the limits uh, of metamaterials uh, broadly uh, beyond uh, what is allowed by passive uh, causal time invariant media. So we've been doing a lot of activity in the area of uh, time varying structures uh, and uh, um, uh, um, like coupling different uh, uh, physics platforms in the same metamaterial uh, um, structure to try to override some of these limitations. And uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, we're well aware how metamaterials can provide extreme wave phenomena, but typically, we need to pay the price in terms of loss and in terms of, of bandwidth responses because of the, uh, um, um, the, the, the limitations that stem from Kramers chronic relations and the causality and passivity. I will show you a couple of directions, uh, uh, very recent directions for us that we've been uh, um, um, exploring uh, in the area of uh, pushing these limits uh, uh, using some uh, um, uh, interesting wave, wave tricks uh, and uh, acoustics is a really uh, nice, powerful platform to demonstrate this uh, phenomena because of the um, relatively low speed of the oscillations and uh, the kind of macroscopic size of the, of the structures. So we have been having a lot of fun in our acoustics lab, and we are also translating uh, several of these concepts uh, uh, as we speak in uh, both uh, radio frequencies and uh, optical frequencies. So the first idea um, I wanted to briefly discuss is the idea uh, that we dubbed a few years ago virtual absorption. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the idea is actually quite uh, simple. It's basically to excite uh, um, um, resonant structures uh, with uh, uh, complex frequencies uh, rather than with real frequencies. Um, effectively, um, essentially non-monochromatic excitations with the right uh, profile of spectrum that interestingly can uh, provide uh, responses that are uh, not uh, bounded by the usual passivity and causality constraints that we expect uh, for uh, um, uh, monochromatic excitations. Mm. A simple way to understand the idea is to start from the simplest possible cavity. That is uh, a one dimensional uh, um, uh, cavity formed by a perfect electric conductor in electromagnetics or a hard wall in acoustics and uh, a nearly ideal reflector, something that is partially reflective but with a good reflectivity. As you know very well, this structure actually supports uh, resonances uh, and uh, uh, these resonances can be observed as uh, peaks in absorption if we assume that there is a little bit of loss in the system. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but in absence of loss, the reflectivity of the uh, uh, cavity must be uh, uh, one, unity, at all frequencies, for all real frequencies. And you can write the expression for the reflectivity quite straightforwardly. Uh, in this expression, beta is the wave number in the medium between the two walls. L is the distance. Uh, uh, Li is the effective uh, shunt inductance of this uh, nearly ideal mirror. Basically, omega Li is the impedance of the structure that is supposed to be uh, reactive because uh, we're assuming absence of loss. And you can immediately recognize if, that if all these quantities are actually real, then you have the ratio of two numbers that are conjugate to each other. And uh, as a result, the reflection coefficient is purely unitary in, a, in, in magnitude along 
the real axis, but interestingly has zeros and points in the complex frequency plane. They are actually complex conjugate of each other because the system is emission. Mm -hmm. This is all well understood. It's compliant with the uh, um, um, passivity and causality constraints, and uh, it, it's pretty boring. Mm -hmm. But a couple of um, uh, years ago, we uh, asked ourselves, uh, what happens if we actually excite this structure at uh, a, a, a complex frequency? Um, interestingly, under certain conditions, you can prove that the structure will respond to the excitation with a complex frequency response. After a transient, after a certain amount of time that depends on the excitation and on the design of your structure, uh, the uh, uh, response will uh, converge to an oscillation that is at the same frequency, at the same complex frequency. And when this happens, under this condition, uh, you will uh, actually achieve the response that you get uh, from uh, analytically continuing uh, the, the, the response that you can retrieve on the real axis into the complex plane. In particular, if we excite uh, at this complex frequency zero, what will happen is that after a transient, the response of the cavity will be zero reflection. Despite the fact that there is no loss, at each cycle of the incident wave, that notice it's actually exponentially growing in time. So this is a, a plot of the wave as it comes in, a snapshot in time. So you see that it's growing. The, the, the future is larger than the present or the past. But uh, at each instant in time, the uh, um, uh, reflections from the uh, uh, front wall will be perfectly canceled by the leaked energy that from the cavity that uh, uh, comes out from the stored energy given past times. The two cancel uh, through interference, and there is no reflection. Indeed, as predicted by the analytical continuation of the reflection coefficient in the complex plane. And what this implies, of course, is that there is no real absorption, but uh, there is a stored energy. The system actually captures the energy uh, and uh, will release it uh, in the future after the excitation is stopped. Uh, one thing to consider is that for complex frequency excitations, the excitations must be finite in time, because at either minus infinity or plus infinity, they will actually grow to infinity. So at some point in the future, when you stop the excitation, or you hit non-linearities because the signals are too large, the um, storing will stop. Um, so this is a, a, a simulation that we did uh, uh, some time ago to, to prove the principle in actually a, a, a waveguide terminated with a, a, a dielectric uh, resonator. And if you look at the field profile, you notice that uh, as long as you keep pumping with this, uh, um, um, signal, the reflection is, is actually zero. The energy piles up at the end of the cavity. And only when you stop it, the energy will be released back to the port. Of course, if you integrate over all times, each reflection coefficient for each fre real frequency component will be identically unity, as it should be, because power is conserved. But interestingly, as long as you pump at the complex frequency, the energy is stored and trapped in the uh, um, cavity at the bottom. And interestingly, you can do things with it. Uh, in fact, you can control the release. Uh, if you have no linearities, you can even trap it. We have shown this for, for even single photons in a, a different uh, line of, of research. Mm -hmm. But uh, one um, uh, interesting additional degree of freedom comes if you have more parts. And of course, uh, Doug Stone and many of his collaborators have uh, uh, told us that uh, if you have two parts, for instance, you can realize coherent control of light through light by, if you have a, a real absorption, material absorption, playing with the phase of the two signals, you can actually uh, uh, tailor the absorption coefficient as a function of the uh, interference of the two waves. And therefore, we proved the same principle in acoustics with uh, a, a two-part resonator. It's uh, a bar uh, um, um, resonant uh, cavity formed by um, discontinuities of the bar thickness, we can launch uh, uh, waves from the two ends, and we can actually monitor the reflections at the two parts. And by varying the phase of the two parts, we can change how the system uh, stores the energy through this virtual absorption concept. This is work done using a, a, a 1D laser vibrometer. So we can measure 
vibrations of plane and it's working in collaboration with the Massimo Ruzzene uh, now at the CU Boulder. Mm -hmm. So here you notice the incident wave. The horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is the cavity. The, you notice that the waves from both sides are impinging in phase with the growing intensity and the energy is uh, 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 fully stored. There is no scattering as long as you keep pumping. When you stop pumping, the energy that is captured, you know, is in a specific mode. This will depend by the complex frequency of excitation you choose, what mode you store the energy in, will be released uh, by one or more of the compatible scattering modes, the, the um, um, release modes of the energy. And these are experiments confirming the result. Mm -hmm. So if the phase between the elements, uh, it, it, between the parts is zero at all times, indeed we experience this result. Uh, this is uh, the, the input power at both parts. The reflected power is zero as long as we keep pumping and then it's released after the pumping. These are measurements. And this is the stored energy, the integral of these quantities, indeed showing that you can pile up energy and then release it uh, symmetrically in this case to both parts. However, if you now choose a profile of phase uh, before releasing, you can actually tell the mode to choose which part to go to. And in this case, most of the energy actually is released to the left part and only a small portion to the right part. So this already shows that with coherent control, you can actually uh, choose the direction of, of release of the energy. You can essentially uh, tell the stored energy where to go and how to be released. Uh, um, in, in, in the two parts. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is neat and has a lot also to, uh, to do with time reversal, by the way, I'm happy to go over this more details if you're interested. But um, uh, uh, after that, we asked ourselves, uh, can we actually do the, the reverse of that? Can we do virtual gain rather than virtual loss? Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed you can, you can actually excite the poles that lie because of passivity in the lower half of the complex frequency plane. So they correspond to signals that actually are decaying in time rather than growing in time. And uh, to, to simply understand how you can get gain out of a passive uh, uh, structure, uh, you can uh, um, understand it by looking at this simple picture. Uh, this is a transmission line. And we are assuming there is some loss in the, uh, in the transmission line and that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, choose the level of, of, of decay of the signal. If the signal is not decaying, we are exciting at the real frequency, the signal across the transmission line actually decays with the position because of the loss. This is the usual decay of a complex wave number because of the presence of loss. However, if you choose your decay rate to be actually uh, equal, to the decay rate of the signal of the excitation to be equal to the decay rate of the mode in the cavity, the response you get uh, along Z is actually a uniform propagation. That makes sense, right? Because uh, past signals were oscillating with a larger amplitude and therefore they've decayed by the time they, they reached here and the, 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 the signal along the line is actually uniform. Uh, uh, so it looks like a lossless line despite the fact that it's, there is material loss, but it's compensated by exciting at the right complex frequency. And in fact, I can even let the, the uh, uh, signal decay faster than the decay rate of the mode, and that gives me gain. This looks like a signal that actually grows in time as I walk along the line for any given instant in time. So this is a very simple picture. Can we do things with it? It turns out actually it's quite interesting. Mm -hmm we can go beyond the limits of uh, uh, passive scatterers or passive metamaterials, exciting at complex frequencies, actually compensating the, the loss, radiative or, um, um, uh, or uh, um, uh, material loss. Um, a good example is actually scattering phenomena. And uh, this is a paper just is coming out now in PRL, um, uh, which is also on archive. Uh, that uh, in which we show that we can go beyond the, the fundamental limits of passivity in scattering problems. Mm -hmm. So you, you may be familiar, for instance, uh, we have this paper, this is from 12 years ago, mm -hmm. in which uh, we demonstrated, uh, uh, together with Professor Engel, at that time I, I was actually just uh, moved from, uh, from Engel's group, 
to, to Austin. And uh, I, I was, uh, uh, we were uh, studying um, the, um, the, the limits of, the, there was this popular topic of zero forest scattering. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out uh, th there is an old paper from, from uh, Kerker, actually, you may know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, in which uh, uh, um, he demonstrated that if you have uh, 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 some uh, anti-parallel electric and magnetic dipoles, like with the right uh, phase, uh, opposite phase, um, you can actually realize the scatterers that have uh, a scattering pattern that is mostly uh, in the backward direction. They actually uh, seem to have uh, zero for a scattering. And of course, uh, uh, this, uh, um, the, the original derivation of Kerker was based on uh, uh, static considerations in which he neglected the uh, radiated power. But if you do the analysis carefully, you can prove that this response is inherently very inefficient. You, there is a trade-off between the total scattered power and the power you scatter in the forward direction. This actually stems straight from optical theorem. The optical theorem tells us that the, the total extinction, that is uh, the sum of the scattered and absorbed power, is always equal to the forward scattering. In fact, in absence of absorption for lossless scatterers, the scattering, the total scattering, must be proportional to the forward scattering. This physically makes a lot of sense because if you have scattering, you are uh, removing part of the energy from the impinging wave, and that must be seen in shadow. The forward scattering is shadow, is uh, what power you have removed from the original scattering. So you cannot expect that the scatterer can uh, uh, scatter only in the backward direction. If there is some scattering, there must be forward scattering. The only reason why Kerker's uh, uh, um, prediction works is that you consider the static response in which uh, the scatterers are so small that the integral of this is uh, uh, very, very small. And when you multiply it by the wavelength squared, you get a very small number. But there will always be a non-zero for a scattering that must balance this equation. And you can see this as you make the particles larger. This is the radius of a sphere as a function of the wavelength. Already at lambda over four, you start seeing that uh, you can minimize the forest scattering, but it must always be non-zero. And already at lambda over two, you must have a very large forest scattering to compensate for the scattering of the, of the sphere. Mm -hmm. By the way, all of these are optimal scatterers that minimize the forest scattering. But you notice already at lambda over two, you cannot have uh, 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 zero forest scattering. In fact, you have maximum scattering in the forest direction, even if it's minimized. Now, uh, can we beat this limit in a passive scattering? Actually, we can if we go to complex frequencies. Mm -hmm. And that's what we proved here. This actually is uh, the uh, uh, zero, uh, sorry, the, the, the forest scattering efficiency, so the ratio between forest scattering and physical cross section of the object, as a function of uh, the real frequency normalized to the size of the object in the complex frequency plane. You notice that the zero forward scattering moves closer and closer to the real axis as the size goes down. This is consistent with what I just showed you in the previous slide. But as the size grows or the frequency grows, you must go into the lower complex up plane. What does it mean? It means that to really get zero forward scattering, you need gain. In fact, if I add gain to my structure, these forward scattering zeros move to the towards the real axis. This, by the way, is completely consistent with this formula because gain is a negative absorption. So I can make the forest scattering zero if I compensate the total scattering by a negative absorption cross-section. Mm -hmm. And that is indeed is what happens. You, you see, this is for a given size. We have a nice uh, uh, for minimum for a scattering here, but we do have a zero for a scattering if you add the gain, the proper amount of gain. Can we do it without material gain? We uh, are all aware in metamaterials for, for over 20 years, we've been talking about using gain for loss compensation for, for many ideas. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, there has been not much success because gain is uh, unstable, is typically very weak, and uh, it's difficult to, um, um, to use in linear systems. Mm -hmm. These are actually, the um, simulations uh, of a sphere excited at the complex frequency in the lower complex of plane um, with the, uh, the targets, the zero 
for scattering. So what we did is to analytically continue this formula from the real frequency plane to the complex frequency plane and excite at the complex frequency. What you notice is that after a transient, these are actually simulations on the two planes in time from the start of the excitation as the signal is decaying with the right rate. Uh, the blue line is, is a monochromatic excitation. So before we start decaying with the right rate. And as soon as you start decaying, indeed, the forward scattering goes to zero. So the sphere, after short transient, so the sphere starts becoming highly directive in the backward direction because you are targeting a zero in the complex frequency plane. These are the, we call them quasi steady state simulations. So this is after the transient, the sphere has, uh, is oscillating at the same complex frequency as the excitation. And indeed the scattering is all directed in the uh, bottom with an actual zero. This, the sphere is not scattering in the forward direction, does not leave any shadow. And the reason it can do that is that it was able to store energy in the, during the transient and can now release it to cancel whatever forest scattering was, uh, uh, was left. This really goes beyond the passivity limitations within, of course, the uh, duration of this excitation uh, with a completely passive structure using virtual gain. And we can go well beyond the metrics, the, the, the fundamental limits of uh, passive uh, structures. This plot shows that this is the, the total scattering versus the minimum, uh, the, the, the forest scattering. For a passive particle, you need to be in this range. You can do lower forest scattering only by sacrificing tremendously the total scattering. With complex frequencies, you do not have at all that bound anymore. Mm -hmm. You can do also virtual lasing. What is virtual lasing? I excite actually a pole. And now I target a, 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 a pole of the structure that is in the complex frequency plane. I choose the right decaying uh, 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 rate of the signal. And I can find that at any instant in time in the quasi steady state, the ratio of the scattered energy in that complex frequency to the excitation can be uh, uh, orders of magnitude larger than what passivity requires. You, you know very well that passivity bounds what is the total uh, scattering, the scattering coefficient of any mode. Uh, um, and the mere coefficient is bound to one. Here we can go uh, uh, to actually the hundreds in terms of the scattering coefficient at the quasi steady state um, excitation. Um, Another application that we're very excited about, and it's actually, uh, this of course, what I showed you, it's uh, uh, numerical results, so they apply to acoustics as well as to electromagnetics. But actually we did an experiment in acoustics to prove uh, one of the uh, holy grails of, of uh, metamaterials, the, the super lens, right? The, the um, uh, original proposal of John Pendry from uh, now over 20 years ago, in which uh, he beautifully showed that if you have uh, a, a metamaterial with uh, a negative index of refraction uh, uh, that is matched to, to the background, then uh, in principle, you can image an object with all its details resolved beyond the diffraction limit, beyond the resolution limits of, uh, uh, of uh, a conventional lens. Of course, uh, we now know after 20 years uh, that uh, it's really hard to get to this condition because uh, the, especially the evanescent components of the image uh, associated with the subwavelength, the details of the image uh, will uh, significantly be affected by any form of loss in the system. Even tiny, tiny amounts of loss will tremendously dampen the subwavelength, the details of the image. So in practice, this idea is limited to uh, uh, operating a little bit better than the diffraction limit, but you cannot really push it to, um, to, to infinite resolution. What we suggest is that we can use the same uh, idea here and compensate for uh, uh, the material loss through the virtual gain. So we use the same exact lens that uh, in, a, in an experiment passive linear time invariant, but we excite it with the right complex frequency and we hit 
a response that is very similar to what an ideal lens should, an ideal perfect lens should support. Um, we do the same trick as I just showed you. We uh, uh, define the performance of the lens in uh, the uh, real, for real frequencies. And then we analytically continue in the complex plane and uh, we excite with complex frequencies. So this, for instance, is uh, for the operation frequency, the transmission coefficient as a function of transverse wave number. This defines the maximum resolution you can get. Uh, gamma equal to zero corresponds to the real frequency excitation. And what you see here is that indeed the lens uh, does a little bit better than a regular lens. Like one is the spectrum of, of propagating waves that it focuses very well. As you go past one, the transmission coefficient decays at about two or three uh, um, past the diffraction limit, it drops significantly because of the presence of loss and, and other imperfections. What we show here is now that if you uh, uh, choose uh, a, a, the, the rate to compensate for the, the complex, uh, 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 the imaginary part of the uh, frequency that, that, that you check from the analytical continuation, you actually can push it back to be completely flat uh, across uh, uh, many wave numbers. At some point, this curve will be limited by non-localities. But in principle, in absence of non-localities, it can actually continue to infinity. Get to get a really perfect lens. And we demonstrate this in, in simulations. You see here how you can resolve a, a, an image with much better resolution than what is allowed by the, uh, by the um, uh, exciting material frequencies. Mm -hmm. These are actually uh, simulations of uh, an acoustic super lens built. This is a, a standard design, by the way, uh, with these uh, uh, tiny channels that basically can analyze the, the response to the other side. And indeed, uh, in simulations, we do observe that we can recover the transmission coefficient across uh, wave numbers that are even 100 times larger than what we uh, uh, expect. And indeed, these are simulations of uh, a target image in, that you cannot resolve well with the real frequency, but as you excite with uh, the right uh, 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 a complex frequency, you resolve the, the response. And then we did an experiment here. We're using a, a 3D laser vibrometer. It's a, a structure that uh, it's a really uh, fancy device that uses three beams uh, 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 focused on the same spot. And uh, uh, through Doppler shifts, uh, we can measure vibrations both in plane and out of plane. So <clears throat> we use uh, an acoustic source. We pass it through this uh, target, uh, to th the super lens, and then we have uh, a vibrating plane in front that can actually help us detect uh, the image. And indeed, uh, these are for the for this sample. In the harmonic case, you can uh, basically see only um, one blurb, but as you in, you tailor to the right decay rate, you can actually retrieve the uh, presence of the three lines from the object. And we did it also for the smiley face, in which you can recover a lot more of the details of the phase. Uh, these are actually the retrieved measurements of the uh, uh, um, um, spatial Fourier components that actually demonstrates that, that we can boost up the, uh, the um, uh, components, uh, uh, especially the high frequency components, uh, uh, up to six times compared to the uh, real frequency excitation and we can basically recover all the damage done by the material loss. Um, maybe let me stop here for a moment and see if there are questions because now I'm switching gears and show you another uh, way in which we are uh, trying to defeat the, the kind of passivity limitations uh, in, in uh, acoustic metamaterials. Um, is there any question, doubt or, or, or comment? Oh, Andrea, I've got a question. Uh, what happens if you now uh, alternate some positively and negatively refractive index slab? So here you just have a single slab, but you know you can alternate positive and negative refractive index media. You had this proposal of uh, Pendry earlier as well. I see. To, to limit the, the amplification of the um, of the. Um... Uh, to, to limit basically the, the effect of material loss because you yes. limit yes. Yes. yes 
uh, I mean, we did not look at that. I assume that uh, if you do that slicing, it will help with the material loss. But again, fundamentally, there will be uh, an effect. Material loss will fundamentally limit your uh, uh, image. Uh, and again, I mean, wh what I would suspect is that in that case, you need a lower uh, uh, imaginary part of the complex frequency to recover the image. Right now, we have to, to decay with a decay rate of 180 hertz in this experiment. If you do that slicing trick, maybe you will recover the image at 60 hertz because the effect of material loss is lower. But you will still get an advantage. You, you can, I mean, what we want to show here is that you can compensate material loss by exciting at complex frequencies uh, without the need for material gain. That, that's, and we, we targeted this very uh, kind of classical problem that we've been uh, struggling with in our community for many years. But uh, this applies to a broad range of, of, of problems in which uh, 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 losses at the moment are, are limiting us and, and passivity. So the obvious question is now, uh, do you plan to do it for electromagnetic waves? Sure, yeah, yeah. We, we are actually working on, on this at the moment. We, we have uh, several, I mean, we, we already have some results uh, for uh, radio frequency waves. Cool. Yes, and uh, we are actually working on an experiment using uh, um, um, high Q optical resonators at the moment, by the way. Uh, in fact, already we have some results in optics uh, uh, in collaboration with Mikhail Lipson. She got also very excited about these uh, uh, results. We were discussing in a, a joint, we have a joint uh, uh, research program. And uh, she and her postdoc uh, in collaboration with, with actually Sengui Kim, he's uh, together with Simon Eves, uh, uh, very two talented postdocs that have been working on this idea in our group. And they, they teamed up with Mikhail Lipson. We have already. Uh, some results demonstrating uh, uh, some of these principles for uh, um, 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 basically uh, 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 overcoupled uh, um, IQ optical resonator. We have demonstrated essentially the, the, the principle there. And now in our lab, we have uh, um, a, a new postdoc that just joined that is working on coupled IQ resonators to demonstrate even more exotic um, um, non Hermitian physics stemming mm -hmm. from exciting at complex frequencies. So this in, in our, I'm very excited about these opportunities and they open actually very significant directions for uh, acoustics, uh, optics and radio frequencies in my opinion. So, uh, by the way, uh, I also want to stress, uh, uh, th this is not magic, right? Uh, it's not that you take an arbitrary sample, you excite it at a complex frequency and it works. You need to tailor your structure Sure. And the spectrum of structure in complex frequency to make it work. It's uh, complex frequencies are not orthogonal to each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not guaranteed that exciting at a complex frequency allows you to uh, converge to a to a um, com to a quasi steady state. That that's uh, the caveat to get this. Most uh, metamaterials, if you take one of your metamaterials in, on your shelf and try to accept the complex frequency will not oscillate at that complex frequency. It's not like in, in for, for monochromatic signals that the linearity forces the system to uh, converge to, to a real frequency after a transient. It can be as long as you want. Here, the, the signals are inherently bounded in time. So mm -hmm. there is no reason why the system has to oscillate at that complex frequency. But uh, remarkably, if you design the system to do it, it does it very well. And it, it does work as the analytical continuation predicts. So that's the surprising aspect. So basically, what our metamaterial is doing is to take a more complex frequency spectrum that is not monochromatic and somehow interfere all these frequencies in time such that uh, the response is the one we want. And it, it's predicted by the analytical continuation. Mm -hmm. Super. So you confirm that I can replace Hertz by terahertz then if you are looking at electromagnetic waves. So you absolutely hundreds of terahertz. Yeah, we're doing wow. this experiment at 1.5 microns. Yeah, but of course, the, yeah, we the, the, what is the trick there? We cannot uh, have signals that decay at uh, 180 terahertz, right, or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what what we do is that we use very high Q resonators, mm -hmm. slow mm -hmm. down light sufficiently that we can actually use decay rates in the gigahertz. Mm -hmm. And that's doable that we have the 
the, the setup, the, the modulators to do it. And in that case, we can do, we, we already have actually uh, some experiments in the- No, it's the a massive achievement. I think it, you know, it's very important for the, the community because we've, be, we've been waiting for 20 years <laughs> for such uh, results. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Wonderful, okay, great. Okay, so maybe quickly, I mean, I see also the time is not uh, uh, to my, <laughs> it's not helping. But uh, uh, wait, wait another... a second, Andrea, one yeah. more thing. Uh, maybe that's my misunderstanding, but yeah. uh, from your previous theoretical consideration, I got an impression that you need to consider signals which are incoming signals, which either decay or grow. Sure. But yeah. In practice, I would say any signal should first decay and the first grow and then decay. So you would have a change of sign somewhere in the process. Would it make a problem for for practical realization or for conclusions? Yeah. Ex excellent question. Yeah. So uh, basically what you are asking is wh what is your transient, right? Uh, um, no signal can, uh, if I, for instance, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm claiming that I'm exciting at a complex frequency that is in the lower compressor plane. So it must decay in time, but it has to have started from somewhere, right? So typically what we do in these experiments we start with the monochromatic excitation. So we start with real, real frequency for, for, for some time. And then we actually measure this. Then we let the signal decay in uh, the, the amplitude. The, the, we modulate that, that signal with a decaying amplitude. And we see that the response of the wave converges uh, uh, to this, of, of, the, of the lens, of the output converges to this. And uh, uh, by the way, to take this measurement, we need to do many measurements because the, the lasers are scanned across the plane, right? So we, we repeat this many times. We scan each, each point and we notice that uh, uh, every time the, the signal, the input signal decays, the output signal follows the same decay and we take the, the amplitude at, at each point. And that gives us the, 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 the output of the image. So this oh, is how even like every pixel is obtained uh, for some continuous process and you repeat it for pixel by pixel or something. Exactly, exactly, yes. For this scanning, yes. This is yeah. similar to what we do in optics with the scanning optical microscope, right? So we are basically using these lasers. The beautiful thing of these lasers is that they can retrieve up to a nanometer of vibration because they use Doppler sh shift. So we can actually observe in real time the map of the of the field, of the pressure field that come out of the lens. And that, uh, that is actually very powerful. Uh, I have more results on that uh, uh, for, for a very remarkable, actually, manipulation of the, of the dispersion of, of elastic waves, yeah. also built by this uh, sample. But yes, there is always a transient, right? So uh, you, uh, what you need to make sure is that when you start your decaying or growing excitation, you wait a little bit, and ideally, you have designed your structure to minimize the transient, such that uh, the signal, as soon as possible, will converge to the same complex frequency output. Then you, you, you can count on the fact that because of linearity, the, the transmission will be whatever is the analytical continuation. But as I said, it's not guaranteed that this will work. Uh, you, if you take a, a random metamaterial and you excite the random complex frequency, I can guarantee you it will not converge to that complex frequency. It will have a lot of other frequencies and it will be a mess. So you have to design properly. Typically, uh, what, what works for us is to try to target metamaterials that have a response that is close to the real frequency so that you do not need to decay very fast or, or grow very fast. That uh, actually helps you get a much uh, um, um, uh, cleaner response in the output with the um, uh, robust uh, um, uh, response in terms of this analytical continuation. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrea, shall we move to the second part of your talk? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, the, the second part of my talk, uh, uh, you may be familiar with, uh, we've done quite a lot of work in the area of polaritons. Basically, the idea is to combine typically light photons with uh, other forms of uh, material responses to uh, provide new degrees of freedom and actually override some of the limitations of conventional metamaterials based just on optical resonances. And in particular, a lot of our recent work has been focusing on phonon 
uh, excitations. So phonon resonance is strongly coupled to photonic optical responses. This, of course, uh, ties well also with the field of optomechanics. When these two uh, uh, resonances are strongly coupled, you get this form of polaritons in which uh, uh, you can actually observe these quasi-particles that are not phonons, are not photons, are truly a, a, a unified combination of the two that uh, uh, are dragged along the material. And uh, I realize I'm short on time, uh, so I, I will not really show you uh, um, uh, all we've done in this area that actually uh, would not be possible in, in uh, one hour even. But uh, one thing we've been uh, having fun with is to demonstrate that uh, these uh, exotic forms of uh, uh, light matter interactions can be used to strongly manipulate the uh, dispersion, the, the, the transport of uh, these quasi-particles on the surface of materials. One demonstration of that has been the idea of combining two of these phonon uh, 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 resonant materials. In this case, we have been using molybdenum trioxide that supports phonon resonances in the mid-infrared range and stack them uh, 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 with a twist. And the interesting, so these, these materials are largely anisotropic. So basically, these phonon resonances are oriented in specific uh, directions. And by playing with the orientation of these resonances on, uh, in, the, in, the, in the stack, you can uh, largely manipulate the uh, dispersion of the surface waves in the, uh, uh, on the structure over large frequencies. This is very remarkable, by the way. It's something that uh, uh, really uh, it, it is uh, associated with the um, high quality factor reson material resonances coupled to strongly uh, um, uh, tailored uh, uh, wave phenomena that, that come from the geometry of this response. So you, you may be familiar with our work. This, by the way, is uh, not, uh, the, the technique we use here to uh, retrieve these fields, these optical fields, uh, is very similar to what I showed you before. With the laser vibrometer, we do it for sound, for elastic waves with uh, this uh, SNOM, with a tip that is excited by an optical wave and we retrieve uh, the mechanical oscillations of the tip to, to detect the, the optical fields in the near field, uh, we do it for light. It's the same, same idea. We, we scan it across an aperture, repeating those, the, the excitation over and over and we can map these fields. And we have shown um, experimentally that for the same frequency, you can transform the same sample from carrying hyperbolic waves to flat directional waves. These are canalized polaritons to el elliptical waves uh, just by tailoring the orientation angle between the optical axis of the two materials. And what I wanted to show you is that we have done this for acoustic waves. Uh, uh, and we are very excited about these results. Most of this is unpublished. But I want to show you first this work. Uh, again, this is a collaboration with Massimo Ruzzene's group. Uh, um, uh, it, this is a Lego metasurface in which we show the similar principle. Basically, this twisting of two different anisotropic lattices creates a moiré pattern. And the idea here was to realize this with a Lego metasurface in which we interleave two lattices of resonators with different frequencies. And that showed the same principle. So elastic waves on the surface that could actually uh, uh, go from uh, hyperbolic uh, to uh, uh, directional to elliptical as a function of the uh, uh, interleaving, the angle of interleaving of the two waves. These are actually experiments demonstrating this on the, on the uh, Lego metasurface. But more recently, and this is uh, um, uh, work uh, uh, done by uh, uh, Simone Eves, a uh, very talented postdoc in our group uh, that has been really uh, taking to the next level this type of uh, laser vibrometry <clears throat> experiments. Uh, um, so we built uh, 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 with 3D printing uh, 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 elastic metasurfaces that support uh, hyperbolic responses. Uh, these are actually measurements demonstrating the uh, uh, propagation of these uh, elastic waves on the surface. And then by twisting the two, we can find uh, uh, indeed, this uh, regime of topological transitions going from elliptical to flat uh, um, to hyperbolic propagation uh, uh, across this twisted bilayer. So these are experiments. The two layers here stacked. This is the uh, laser vibrometer. And indeed, you can observe 
uh, at a given frequency, this uh, complete transformation of the response. This is much easier to do than on Legos, right? On Legos, uh, basically the interleaving is, works for a given angle. It's very difficult to reconfigure. Here, it's literally a rotation of one surface on top of the other. They're st stuck together and you can twist them manually and you can observe uh, as a function of the twist. This uh, uh, drastic reconfiguration of the excitation, uh, you can actually retrieve from this device the, the uh, um, field maps, the, the band diagrams of this uh, structure for all frequencies. And actually these are, uh, even in real time, these are actually beautiful results in my opinion. The uh, excitation in real time of the, uh, of the uh, structure, so multiple frequencies, how they contribute to the, the propagation of these modes and how uh, drastically uh, the, the emission is, is tailored as a function of uh, uh, the, the twist angle of the two surfaces. Now, um, we've done quite a lot of work in this area in optics using our uh, um, uh, near field scanning optical microscopes. Uh, um, and uh, one thing that we showed earlier this year was that uh, uh, you can gain an extra degree of freedom if you actually assume that there are two detuned resonances with a non-trivial angle in between. We have called these the shear polaritons, shear hyperbolic polaritons. The, uh, having two phon phonon resonances in the microscopic structure of material at an angle between each other that is not 90 degrees gives you a, a beautiful opportunities for uh, 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 guiding polaritons in non-trivial ways. In particular, what we have shown is that this shear phenomena uh, give you uh, two uh, uh, remarkable features. One is that uh, the hyperbolic nature of these polaritons rotates uh, on, the in, on the surface of the material as a function of, of frequencies. And the second one is that the hyperbolic branches are actually non-symmetric. You know, this, the, the loss is distributed non-symmetrically between the two branches of the polaritons. These two features are associated with microscopic shear effects that come from the fact that uh, the microscopic structure of this crystal, in this case is gallium oxide, support phonon resonances that are detuned and are non-orthogonal. This is a monoclinic crystal. Uh, without boring you with the details of the optical uh, side, I know you are more interested in acoustics, but we did demonstrate both with far field experiments and with near field experiments these features, this is a new paper just in press using cadmium tungsten oxide to demonstrate this asymmetry and the rotation of the axis of these polaridons on monoclinic crystals. I, I stress there is an acoustic component here too, by the way, because light here is dragging these phonon resonances with it. It's a strongly confined optical fields that drag these phonon oscillations in on the surface. But most importantly, we have now been able to translate this to uh, uh, elastics by realizing metamaterials that have much stronger effects. We can build our own monoclinic crystals. We don't need to rely on uh, typically weak asymmetries in uh, 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 natural uh, organic crystals, typically in the, in the mid-infrared, uh, but we can uh, uh, push it down to any frequency and uh, to, to optimal geometries to, to demonstrate these effects. So this is, uh, um, um, in the case of uh, um, detuned orthogonal resonances, you get a, 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 an hyperbolic response. And this is for asymmetric, no, non-orthogonal uh, detuned resonances in which you get the, the uh, asymmetry of the hyperbolas and the rotation of the hyperbolas. And we've been able to observe both of these in our setup using, uh, again, the, the 3D laser vibrometer here. This is the first demonstration of shear hyperbolic waves in uh, elastic metamaterials by using the uh, tuned hyperbolic uh, um, uh, metasurfaces that are twisted at an angle between the two. And uh, by controlling that angle, you can actually observe both the rotation and uh, the large asymmetry in the hyperbolic branches. One uh, um, um, branch of the hyperbola supports much less loss than the other one. So this is the setup, how it looks like, the shaker that excites the structure at the center, and then with the 
parameter. This is actually the laser spot of the three lasers. We can observe these uh, uh, vibrational modes and uh, uh, observe how they propagate along the, the structure. And indeed, you notice how changing the angle, you go from a symmetric hyperbola to a, a largely asymmetric canalized response. And then it, uh, you go to 90 degrees, you go back to the symmetric response. And you observe also, this is beautiful, the uh, 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 rotation of the plane for, for shear effects as you change frequency. The, this you can observe only because of shear, because of the non-orthogonality of the underlying resonant uh, uh, modes of the structure. And these are actually all field maps, all measured uh, in our lab, demonstrating the rotation angle as a function of frequency and the, the shear effect of asymmetry. Uh, I will stop here. Of course, this uh, leads uh, to, um, to results also in the context of topology. And we've done a lot of this uh, as well. Uh, uh, in fact, maybe the last result I want to show, this is collaboration with Alex Kanikaev uh, here at City College, uh, demonstrating actually how these two concepts can come together. Uh, the, the, the first demonstration of the transfer of topological order from a photonic crystal to a phononic uh, um, uh, resonant material, in this case, baron nitride. And actually, how beautifully you can strongly couple the two and transfer topological uh, uh, order along an, an edge, along a boundary uh, um, uh, between two top topological photonic crystals uh, um, uh, um, uh, onto the, the, the phonon. Actually, you can measure with, with the, uh, uh, this is in far field, by the way, because these, these modes are actually leak. So we can measure it uh, uh, in, in far field, but really measure the degree of, of phonon uh, response in the topological polariton mode as a function of as you go away from the um, uh, from the broadside uh, you get closer to the to the light cone you start seeing the the prominence of the phonon response the, the coupling to the phonon order because of the um, more tight uh, optical modes in the boron nitride uh, thin film anyway this concludes my talk i showed you a couple of directions we've been exploring uh, in, in acoustics uh, and in optomechanics, basically, uh, um, complex frequency excitations and uh, uh, polaritonic responses. What I'm particularly excited about is this idea of learning from uh, our uh, polariton work and bringing it down to metamaterials in which we can uh, totally override the, the typical assumptions on dispersion engineering over uh, metasurfaces by uh, realizing metamaterials with uh, uh, um, um, uh, non-trivial uh, uh, band diagrams and, and dispersion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for this uh, great talk. So I welcome uh, questions from the audience. Please, people, uh, come forward with your questions.